Hi, this is Chaz Palminteri, and welcome to the Chaz Palminteri podcast. Before I introduce my next guest, I just want to tell you that um, don't forget, go to chazpalminteri.net. Starting in March, I will be doing my United States tour of my one-man show, A Bronx Tale. A Bronx Tale, all you guys know the whole story, how the whole thing happened with me and Swifty Lazar and how I became famous. I don't want to go through that, but chazpalminteri.net. My merchandise is on there. Also, don't forget to go to my restaurants, 30 West 46th Street, 264 White Plains. So I am, I got to tell you, this is my 49th podcast. I am so excited to have this gentleman here. I know this man for the past 30 years, 30 years, 30 years ago, when I was just about becoming famous, I said, you know, I, I got, I don't know how this is all affecting me. I was getting really nervous. So I said, I want to see a shrink. And people told me there's only one shrink to see, and that's this guy. And I said, why is that? He goes, and the reason, and what they told me was, he sees all the big people. You have to see his list. I said, I don't, <laughs> I'm not worried about his list. Is he a great shrink? And you know what? He's probably the most brilliant shrink I ever, I ever spoke to in my life. Uh, he wrote two bestsellers, him and uh, his partner, Barry Michaels. For those of you who have any problems and you're thinking about <laughs> doing crazy things, Pick up the book, The Tools. I recommend it to all my students all the time. And the book, Coming Alive, talking about life and how to be happy. Here he is, the one and only Dr. Phil Stutz. Anyway, you're going to see me rocking back and forth during this show. That's for my medication. I have Parkinson's disease. Luckily, I don't have a horribly severe case, but it's a medium, medium I would say, case of Parkinson's. Um, so if you see me moving around like that, um, well, you can think whatever you want. <laughs> you think I'm not so, um, but hopefully it won't distract you too much. I, I don't think it will. Okay. Phil, how are you? I am great, and uh, I appreciate you inviting me. Um, maybe I'll be able to say some things to you on the air that I wouldn't say in private. We'll see. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> right, I, I won't. For the past... <laughs> For the past 30 years, uh, I went to school with you and learned so much. And I'm sure that people, uh, when they get their Oscars and their Emmys, they don't want to mention their uh, their analysts. But if well, if I ever win one, well, I won a few Emmys, but if I ever win one, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I, I dedicate this to my shrink, Mr. Phil Stutz, because without you, Phil, I don't think I'd be here right now, man. I, I really, I'm, I'm honored that you feel like that because at my age, the money and the big prizes, you know, I'm 75 years old, it doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter. No, but the greatest feeling in the world is to treat somebody, if you want to call it treating, whatever you want to call it, guide them over a long period of time Right, and you, and you can feel that something's happened to them. You know, the, Something's happened. Yeah, people that say, um, it's impossible to change. It's, it's bullshit. It's not impossible to change. Most people don't have the courage, faith, or energy to change, and they, they give up at some point. Right. I mean, what do you think, Phil? I mean, you know, the negativity in the world right now, it's almost like we have any, we're having like a civil war. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's one side against the other side. I think the negative, I remember you telling me this, that the negative forces are so strong on earth. And, and the positive force, why is it the negative forces are stronger on Earth than the positive forces? Yeah, great though? question. The answer is the negative forces are stronger because they're easier to contact. In other words, to contact the positive force, think about it. It takes discipline. It takes patience, right? Right. It takes some degree of faith. The bad stuff, I can go out and order a bottle of gin, boom, I'm right there, you know. Heroin, chocolate cookies, loss of, all these things, they're right, right in front of, they're easy. Right. And they're pro they promise something they can't deliver, which is some kind of satisfaction. So when you say they promise something they can't deliver, that's like we talked about, it's like immediate gratification. Yes, that's correct. Right. And so immediate gratification, I mean, I think, I think you, you it's just that simple. The world, is fucked up, or people are fucked up because everyone in the world wants immediate gratification. Yes, that's right. Now, 
The desire for immediate gratification causes chaos, and I'll tell you why. Every time someone goes for it, they feel like shit afterwards. Everyone, I don't care who you are. And um, so, so then you, you didn't get it over there, so you'll look over here for it. You'll look over here, somebody will tell you, hey, come meet this girl. It doesn't matter what it is. It's chaos. And the opposite of chaos is order, is discipline, which moves forward into the future, being willing to sacrifice immediate, immediate pleasure or immediate gratification. And so our society is in chaos, and the underlying reason for that is what I just said. Everybody's going on their own path, on their own course, because it's compelling. They think they can get something immediately. Now, there's three aspects of, um, of human life that nobody can escape from. One is uncertainty, one is pain, and one is the need for constant work. Those three things, nobody gets away with, from those things. So, and that's called exoneration. Everybody wants to be exonerated. I got the best looking girlfriend, I got the most, I got this and that, and because I do, I'm exonerated from playing by the rules. And I mean, you're a great example of it, where you, you turned that around and made it a source of power and confidence. But that takes, a, that takes time. Right, right. Do you feel, Phil, that the internet absolutely uh, made it worse for people? I mean, I think it did. It didn't make it worse. It made it a thousand times worse. <laughs> think about it. You, uh, with the, the problem is immediate gratification, right? The inability to control yourself. And you know, there, there, is, there are these flashing images right in your face that tell you, hey, little boy, come over here. So it, it, the... the Density, the, the amount of interactions you have with evil, if you want to call it evil. You can call it evil, yeah. It's so, the, the amount of them, let's say in a day, is so much higher than what it, what it used to be. Think about it, if a guy's a farmer, he doesn't have time for a lot of this shit. He's got to, he's got to plow the land or whatever else farmer, farmers do. But a person in the, in the modern world, he's trying to squeeze as much experience as he can. It's like, it's like trying to... Um, Squeeze twenty pounds into a ten foot ten, <laughs> ten, ten pound bag. Bag, right? Yeah, and eventually the bag breaks. Everything breaks, and when everything breaks, everybody's dissatisfied, and then everybody goes at everybody else. It's your fault. It's your fault. Whoa! So because they're not getting the twenty pounds in a ten pound bag, they blame everybody else. They blame yes, and that's the, that's the crux of the victim. I mean, because everybody on the internet is is negative. I mean, they're writing reviews of restaurants they hate. If you say something, everybody jumps on you. People are getting canceled. People, uh, uh, everything is, they're obsessed with beauty and everybody's pretty. Now they got filters, Phil. They have filters that girls and men put on, oh. but it's not really them. <laughs> it looks like them. But nobody looks like that, Phil. <laughs> it's fucking crazy. I'm yeah. telling you, it's crazy. And it's only getting worse. And I don't know where it's going to end. Yeah. You know, things like that can only be improved or, or uh, resolved when a certain number of people say, fuck it, I've had it. I can't live like this anymore. And when that's going to happen and how effective it will be, I don't know. I'm an optimist, so I feel those people are out there. They're terrified now, you know, from every point of view, because part X. Right. So we, we, we just call part X the destructive part of the personality. It doesn't want you to learn, grow, realize your potential. That's part X, right. That's called part X. What was I saying? You're saying part X is the, that's, we call it, that's part of the destructive personality. Yeah. So look, everybody's got a part X, everybody, and, and we'll have it for the rest of your life. That's the hardest thing for people to accept. They say, I'll use the tools, I'll do this and that, but when is it gonna be easy? And the answer is never. It can be, it can I be, remember that, yes. It can be satisfying, gra uh, gratifying, um, pleasurable, and creative. It could be all those things, but, not, but first you have to pay the piper over here. And that's part X. So everybody has to pay the piper. No, no, no exoneration. Wow. I remember 
I mean, I remember, like out here, I was telling, you know, my son, my son Dante, I was telling him that it's great. Now he came out here, he moved out here and he's going to, you know, work out here a little bit. He's a singer, songwriter, actor. But I said to him, I said, you have to be careful about L.A. because it seduces you. It's so pretty and so nice that six years, five years could go by like that <laughs> with just you going to lunch and going to the beach. Yeah. You know, more than New York, wouldn't you say, Phil? Oh, much more. Much more. Yeah, because New York, there's always something difficult, painful, reminding me <laughs> of what <I> was. <laughs> right. Just going to the dry cleaners is painful. Yeah, going right. to the store, shopping, painful. Getting <laughs> Starbucks, painful. That's right. Out here, everything is for you. It's just easy, man, right? Yeah. I, uh, Dante, I would advise you for your first year out here not to talk to anybody who's from L.A. Just try for a year. <laughs> It'll help you a lot. Yeah. We, are you hearing him okay with the mic? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Um, what I wanted to ask you, Phil... Because I, I, I got so many guys that tell me, they go, you know, how do you how do you stay, uh, f you know, faithful? How do you how does a man stay faithful living in L.A. with all these gorgeous women? And I told I told these people, I said, well, it's I remember you told me it's a projection. You look at a woman and you're from far away, right? And it's a projection. But then you told me the closer you get, the, the blurrier the projection becomes. And then you're left with the real person. Yes. And then a lot of times you, you're disappointed. You feel you've been tricked, gypped. And, but the main thing is then you go on to replace her or him with somebody that you think will embody the, the fantasy, but they won't. It's just, you know, some people will embody it right away. Others, you won't, you won't see it for a while. But you, if, you, if you want to talk about relationships, the secret is relationships require work. And... You could say a, a a relationship itself, no matter who the two people are, um, is it, there's a certain set of rules that you have to fulfill. I mean, I don't know if you want to talk about it now. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. Okay. The f okay. The first thing is, I wonder. You think we should draw things here, or you don't? You don't can do that. We could we could draw it and later and then show it. I'll show it on the camera. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The first thing Chad mentioned, um, and you know, as an actor, it comes up all the time anyway, um, is is projection. Is the two, this tool is called projection removal. Now, what does that mean? If oh, there you go, good, good. Um, we said projection and removal. What does that mean? Okay, it means if you. Let's say this is a movie projector, right? And right. The screen back here. Right. Now, if I move the, the projector close, 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 right up to the, I mean, I, I, I wherever, move. If I move the screen up to where the projector is. Right. I get no image, right? To get the image, you have to be at a distance. Yes. Right. That's called projection by unavailability. The person's unavailable, which means emotionally they're at a distance. And then into that distance, you can project whatever you want onto them. Wow. Now, but what happens is as they, you spend more time with them, you get to know them better, that sense of distancing goes away. And all of a sudden, you, they're getting closer and closer and closer to the um, screen, if you will. Right. And at that point, the projection falls apart. And then it reveals the real person. You will be really pissed and bereft and disappointed. And then you, you tend to take it out on the other person. <laughs> yeah, well, you know the drill. Uh, wow. Now, so, but when does a, I, I know what you're saying, but th this is a question I always wanted to ask you. People go, relationships take work. Right. When do you know, Phil, and I think people uh, would like to know this, when do you know when it's too much work and you know what, two people shouldn't be together? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say there's two answers to that. Um, the first one is you have to feel the other person is making as much effort as you are. It's the most important thing. They don't have to grow as fast as you, as you have grown. They don't have to agree with everything you say, but they have to, in their, in their own mind, in their own world, they have to be moving forward. And the person that, you know, you say, you meet somebody, you say, that person's spoiled. What, you, what you're really saying is they don't think they have to do the work. Wow. Now, now, there's another thing. Am I talking too much? No, go. No, please. No. <laughs> okay. 
there's another aspect of this. Um, I remember what I was talking about. Um, we were talking about the first aspect. There was two aspects of, of when is it too much work oh. where, where you just go, all right, you know what? I'm out of here. Yeah. So that's one whole thing that can be discussed. The second thing is, um, is uh, are they capable of changing? That's, are that's they something. capable of changing? Yeah. And there, there are three things that somebody has to accept and do if they want to be in a relationship. If they, if they don't do these three things, they're incapable of a relationship. Now, the, the three things are, if I can remember them, um, sacrifice. Um, should I take this carefully, but I'll get it. Oh, it's all right. Well, uh, you know, we're here. Our fans are listening. Sacrifice is one of them. I think that's right. Oh, I, empathy is another one. Empathy, sacrifice, empathy. And... And what would be the third one? This is like being a junior high school. I'm fucking this up. Uh, no, that's all right. You know, uh, we're, we're riding with initiative. you. Initiative. So. Initiative. Okay, so initiative means, like, if let's say a typical thing, a woman's waiting for, for somebody to call her. She just met this guy. Seems like a nice guy. But he hasn't called her at all. I, I'll tell her, forget it. Get rid of him. Um, right. It's the equivalent of that thing in the movie. It's not exactly the same. Right. You know the uh, what do you call that principle? Oh, the door test. The door test. The door test in Bronx Tale. The door test. I remember that. Yes, of course, I wrote it. Yes. I'm going to tell you guys something, especially because I, yeah, especially the younger people here and only two. Um, what the wisdom that he got, even from before me. I mean, we're in the same wavelength, so we. I think he got a lot from me. But before me, his upbringing. What he was exposed to and how he reacted to it is very unusual. By the way, that's why that movie was so successful right off the bat, because people said that's the truth. Right. Um, so you have towns in this area. Let me know when you want to take on some patients also. <laughs> well, I do this thing called neighborhood logic. I, I do neighbor logic on my. Uh, I have an. Ep I do podcasts in neighbor logic. Where everybody, in fact, I'm glad to remind me. Everybody calls in, and I. And this is who I studied with for the past thirty years. And believe me, I'm going to save you a lot of money. You don't have to pay him, because he's. He, forget about it. But I say to you is, if you have a problem, call me, neighborhood logic, and I answer it. And I only got, I, I and I did it, and I. Dedicate everything to him because what I learned about life and people and relationships is from Dr. Phil Stutz. So, so there is a time then when you say if a person's not doesn't have initiative, doesn't have empathy, is not willing to put the work in, where you go, you know what, this is not going to work. Yeah, you have to be realistic about it. Even even if you're wrong, you're right. Meaning, in terms of self-esteem, self-regard, it's like I deserve to get these three things. If I don't get them, I'm unhappy. I'm I'm not saying just fucking tell the person drop dead and walk and walk off but if they're not corrected if they're not corrected yeah if they're not corrected in your mind then that's the time to say okay it's time to go yeah which brings up another subject so to speak which is how do you get yourself to leave a situation where you really would not leave you right you prefer to stay but you have to leave because the person's violated the the principles that were working. right so that ability to let go of somebody, even if you're still in love with them or whatever, right? That's called the potency of non-attachment. In other words, you you want you love the person, you want to be with them, but you're not attached enough to let them go, even though you'd rather they didn't go. But you think about it, because then only then will they would you know how they feel about you if if there's no demand. exactly. So anyway, that's a, that's another part of this thing. But empathy, initiative, and sacrifice. I n I've never gone wrong with those three things. Right, because that's, I think you're right. I think that's important. I mean, why is it they say, Phil, like uh, with guys, uh, guys are different than men. You know, men go, uh, you ask a woman, what qu What do you want in a man? Oh, I want him to be funny. I want him to make a good living. I want him to be romantic. I want him to be uh, caring. I want him to love children. I want him to, they'll, they'll come up with 20 things. You, <laughs> and and I, please, I don't want to sound sexist, but I probably am. But if you ask a guy, what do you want? What do you want? And we're, guys, are, we're simple. We're simple. Just, you know, give him good sex, feed him. And don't break his balls, and he's fine. 
and he's fine. But women, you know, they'll come up with 30 things, and we always go, listen, we can do those things. Just give us these three things. Just give me these three things. You think I'm gonna? You think we should cut that out, or is that too much? It's <laughs> great. Okay. But ladies, I just tell you, just do that. Give him great sex, feed him, and just don't bust his balls. And you know what? He'll never cheat on you. He'll be there forever, forever. It's just that simple. I hate to sound like that, Phil. But <laughs> that's my neighborhood logic, anyway. You know, I mean, that's that's how I feel. Do you, I, I wanted to ask you: Do you feel like when when a person but there's that state, that famous statement, men, most men live their life of quiet desperation. Yeah. Why is it that most marriages that I know, the, the people are unhappy, but they refuse to leave? Why is that, Phil? Um, the reason is human beings like um, familiarity, and um, they, they like to function in an environment where they think they know everybody and everything about that environment so and that's where the, this part x we've been we right we've been mentioning before so that's like the devil you know is better than the devil yeah, you don't know yeah even though he, you know now they're doing a lot of work psychophysiological work in the brain right and they discovered see the, the neurons in the brain are not the same as um the the, I mean, the rest of the body the, the neurons in the brain work as circuits it's right. not just one cell it's the circuits connect to other cells now and what that does is it makes the human brain very powerful even to the point that it can that it can heal itself and the reason it's so powerful is if one neuron gets damaged i mean this is oversimplifying the difference. yeah no good but if, if one cell gets damaged because it's a uh what do you want to say because it's a, it's a it's a cycle not a cycle it's a it's a circuit. A circuit, right? Then one cell could go bad, but there's other cells that can take its place. You see, and that's where the self-healing comes in. And people say, "Well, that's a pipe dream," you know. But I say it's it's not. It's just people have to have some faith. I mean, some faith in in their potential to do that. So self-healing is one of the big topics that come here. Right. So they have to be willing, if they're willing to leave their spouse. Right. Do they have to be willing to take the pain? That's right. They have to. So, so if most people, like you taught me this, that most human beings don't want pain. We don't want any pain. In fact, he's hoping or she's hoping that they leave them so they could get out. But for them to make the choice to get out, for you to be the initiative, the initiative, you can't do it, but only growth happens when you decide to say, all right, you know what? That's enough. I'm out. Yeah. I'm out. That's good. Maybe it's worth uh, mentioning something else to the people that are really studying this stuff, which is a lot of this depends on instinct. So and the most important decisions you make in your life, you won't have enough information. You just won't. If, if you do have enough information, I don't even consider it a decision. Whoops. Anyway, um, there's a, so you have to trust your instincts. There's no, there's no way to be certain of anything, including a, a relationship. You know, should I stay in or not? Now, if you draw a circle like that, the first step is intuition, which means you have to go on what you got, what you're picking up, right? Right. The second step is. Um, a decision, like you might say, well, I, my gut tells me I gotta get out of this. I have to get out. We'll talk more about that. Right. Um, and the next thing is action. Now, people always ask me, why do you put action separate from a decision? I decide something, I'm, but it doesn't work like that. Most of the time, people <clears throat> make a decision to do something, and they don't do it. And the reason they don't do it is part X is scaring the shit out of them every second. Just what you said, Part X doesn't like change. Right. It makes you afraid of change. But anyway, the, 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 the most important part of this circle is, is called um, consequences. And you can't, if you want to trust your instincts, then you have to make a decision based on your instincts. Then you have to act. You have to carry out the decision. But then you have to tolerate the consequences. And most people are afraid of consequences. They don't like it. So if you can say, well, you can stay here forever, 
and you never have to face consequences. Most people would accept it, believe it or not. So, wow. Yeah. So, you see, you have very strong instincts, like very strong. And I don't think I've ever seen you not... When, when, you, when, when you finally realized it was time to do something, you, you did it. I did it, yes. Yeah. Yes, because I, I believe in... Because what you taught me was... If I'm if I'm scared, if I'm fearing something, if I'm worried about how I'm, I'm going to be painful, that's when I know I have to do it. Yes. Because that's the signal that no matter how painful it is, I have to do it. If I don't do it, I won't grow. And I, you taught me that nothing grows in the comfort zone. That if you want to grow, you have to like be willing to have pain. I mean, you should. I remember you gave me a metaphor once of the pearl. You said like an oyster, an oyster, it, it rots, it dies, but out of that comes the pearl. Yeah. And and that's what life is about. It's hard to say no. It's hard to leave another person. It's hard, but if you're living a life of quiet desperation and you're not happy, there's one guarantee: you will be unhappy the rest of your life. Yeah. That's true. But the guarantee is if you take the chance and deal with the pain, there is a chance and a good chance that hope and happiness will find your way. Yes, 100%. 100%. I mean, I, and, I, and I thought it would be good to talk about that because I meet so many people that wish they took, they want to leave their job to do, a, they want to do something. Oh, I always wanted to be a chef. I always wanted to be an actor. I always wanted to, I wanted to go to law school. Uh, oh, I'm not happy in my marriage. I'm not happy with my husband. Most people live lives of quiet desperation. Yeah. Like we said, and I and I and that's because of the pain. But I tell everybody out there, Phil Stutz, Dr. Phil Stutz, taught me, and that's why I'm here today, and and I've been successful for all these years. Every time I don't want to do something and it's painful, I do it, and it always comes out good. Yeah, in your case, it's come out great. Yeah, we have some of the evidence right sitting right there. I have <laughs> some of the evidence right there. My son Dante and my daughter Gabriella, and and, and Phil, I, you know, I, I never really talked to somebody about this uh, on camera, and but I think you, you'll be. Why is it that Bronx Tale has been sustaining all these years for thirty something years? And I, I and I want to sound like I'm I'm bragging about it, but I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna have to sound that way. But like colleges, Europe, uh, I was in Bahrain, I was in Saudi Ara yeah. I was in Saudi Arabia, I was in Dubai. They all bring up that movie and all bring up that teachers teach it to their kids. And I I just you know the one man show is still survive. You know and people go they like the one man show better than the movie and the musical. You know, so it's incredible that I, I think I just touched a chord that people just relate to. Well, the one thing about you that's very, 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 very unusual is that you can, um, you can be, uh, create a work that's very entertaining. It's really entertaining. You go to see it no matter what. And then you put these intense value issues or whatever we're calling them yes. into a movie that dramatically works. The worst thing is somebody trying to do that and fail. Because right. then it's like somebody lecturing you. It's a disaster. It's a, le it's a lecture. Yeah, You're it's right. a lecture, yeah. But, yeah, so the idea is to, to write something that that's meaningful, but to entertain the people the same way. Yeah, you know, people, you get some of these snotty writers, which I've met a few thousand. Um, right. And they, they feel... I understand it, but they feel like I'm not going to um, submit to the materialistic, studio-controlled right. um, environment. I'm going to I'm going to resist that, and that's not a bad idea, a feeling for a kid. Right. But he also there's a point where he's going to have to submit. Everybody reaches that point. And um, what, what you want to train people is to say, yeah, I'm going to be myself and hold myself as the ultimate value judge. But at the same time, I have to know judiciously when to submit. And the, the, the Bronx Hill, the original thing, let me tell you guys, um, 
Hollywood went crazy when he did what he did. Uh, they went fucking crazy. It was crazy. And I think it was, it was double edged. You know, his part was great, part wasn't so great. You handled it great, I thought. But you, what, it was like you, uh, you resisted the law of physics. That's what I was telling. Right. This guy's like floating over the studios up here. I mean, I, I don't know how I did that. They offered me two hundred fifty, five hundred, and one million dollars to walk away, and I still had two hundred dollars in the bank, and I said, "No, I'm not doing it." You know, yeah. And it worked out great. Bob De Niro saw it and loved it. Bob called it the greatest one man show he ever saw, and uh, I agree with that. By the way, whoa, well, thanks. And he, uh, and it was because of Bob that I, I you know, I, I he said no, he could do it and he could write it. And but when I wrote it, Bob just left it alone, and he trusted the material. Yeah, he you trusted know, me. He, yeah, that's a, I can't say any better than that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if I would have sold it, it would have got sandblasted and changed, and it wouldn't have been what it was. It couldn't have been what it was. Yeah. And by the way, what you're doing with this show and some of your, your other activities is good, because that's the correct way to pay it forward into the show business community. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I actually sell the card on my on my on my site, chasbumtery dot The saddest thing in life is wasted talent. Yeah. I have that card. I gave it to my son when he was born. I gave it to my daughter. And I put it in their room, and I said, "You look at that card and remember." As they grew up, they said, "All right, all right, Dad, all right." They both, you know, my son graduated Berkeley. My my daughter graduated. <laughs> uh, my daughter's uh, sophomore at the University of Michigan, the top musical theater school. So, the strivers, and I think. I think you have to instill that in a child. I mean, for the parents out there, Phil, what do you think is the most important thing to instill in your children? You think in a child? I would, to me. Yeah. I would say kindness is the most important thing. Whoops. Yes, kindness. I I agree with you. I I think you have to gr- teach more to be children to be morally good kids. Yeah. You know, everybody's obsessed, especially out here in New York. I want my child to go to Harvard. I want him to go to Yale. I want him to go to Princeton. I mean, and then look what happened when the the scams when they try to get their it's kids. This whole thing schools. is disgusting. To me, it's disgusting. I mean, doesn't that hurt the child more? It, Phil? It, it's horrible. See, there's two kinds of routes to success. So the first route is uh, is the route to mediocrity. You know, there's a there's like a pathway that a million people have walked before you. The route to mediocrity. Yeah, went to Harvard, then went to, um, what do you call it? Uh, Princeton, yeah. Yeah, yeah, whatever, Goldman Sachs. It's actually, and I don't fault people, because some people are strong, but they they want to know every step of the way that they're safe. This is what we talked about before. Right. That's cool. That's, that's the, um, what do you call it? Well, that's the power system. You gravitate towards power. Now, there's, there's the opposite system, which is a, a route that you create yourself. You don't give a fuck about what anybody else thinks. Your mission is to create and let the, let, let the chips fall where they may. And it's very hard. You know, the kid sees all his friends going for the first, the power system, instead of this creative system. But what I always tell people is, when you're 92, when you look back on your life, even if it didn't work out as well as you would have liked it to work out, you can say to yourself, I made my decisions based on who I really am and based on my instincts. Wow. With some, obviously, I don't, you don't want to be 100%, but if you could get up to like 80%, you'd be doing pretty good. Um, wow. You should, do, how about telling about your father that, that with that kid he was training? Yes. You didn't oh, tell him that? Yeah. Oh, the kid that I was training. My dad. My dad was a. Uh, he was a bus driver, of course, but he was also a professional fight trainer. He was a great uh, dad. My my dad boxed, and he was a great trainer. And he taught me, and I taught my son, and my son will teach his son. But there was this one fighter. I won't mention his name. He's still around, and he was a great fighter. And but my dad said he'll never. He'll never be a champion. And I said, Dad, are you kidding me? He's knocking everybody out now. He goes, yeah, but when he gets to the really tough top, top, top 10 guys, he'll never make it. And I said, why is that? He said, well, you know, he doesn't, he likes to do his road work at, 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 when the sun goes down at 5 o'clock at night. And he runs five miles at 5 o'clock. I said, does he run the five miles? And my father said, yeah. 
I said, well, Dad, what's the difference? He's running the five miles when the sun goes down as opposed to he's got to get up at 4.30. Like, like oh, mostly all the fighters get up at 4.30 before the sun comes up. But my father said, he, if you can't get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, you won't get up in the 13th round <laughs> when the guy knocks you down. And that means your discipline is not as strong as you think it is. And my father was right. And he never became champion. He fought. He was a really good fighter, but he, you know, got to like the top 20 in the world and then faded away. And my father was right because discipline, I've always taught this, discipline is the most important thing that you could have. Order. Order. Order is the right word. Order is the right word. Not, yeah, not this. Order. Knowing, you told me, you helped me such a great deal. You said the way not to waste your days is to plan your day the night before, mm -hmm. knowing what you have to do. And I never forgot that. And you taught me that. And so do I do it every time? No, but I do it when I really have to, and I try to do it as much as I can. Because you could just waste the day easy. Yeah, it's easy, yeah. I mean, you taught me. You said that uh, Eugene O'Neill didn't write his classics till he was in his 60s, I think. Yeah, yeah, this is la yeah the last two things he wrote. Um were the, actually the best. And he was yeah, The Iceman Cometh and I think Long Day's Journey, yes. Yeah, and he was already famous, but he 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 was compelled to get something out of himself. That, that's what it was. He, at, by that point, you don't really care very much. It's like, I don't, I don't care that much about it. now how I'm received. I did a lot when I was younger. Right, but, right. Uh, now, these books, I mean, I have to tell you, folks, and, and this is really, I know he, he doesn't like when I say it, but... but you have to read the tools and you have to read uh, the other book that him and Barry Michaels, uh, another uh, Dr. Barry Michaels wrote. Uh, if you're feeling, you know, it, it just, it, it just helps with, with, with guiding through life it, it, because he gives you tools. You know, a lot of times, you know, you'll see a therapist and there's, there's some wonderful therapists out there and some wonderful psychiatrists, but they'll tell you this about that, about your mother and about this and your father and I believe in what Dr. Phil Stutz does and Barry Michaels, they give you a hammer, a hammer and a saw. In other words, they give you a tool to fix the thing. So you could always refer to that and go back to that. So when, am, am I saying it right, Phil, I think? Yeah, see, here's the thing. People, mostly people want to do things that scare them. They do, and they, they tend to really know what the things are. Right. The problem is you can't get somebody to do something new Unless they have a reasonable expectation that it's going to work. Not a right. guarantee, but a reasonable expectation. And the singular thing you can give them by far more important than anything else is a tool. Even if the tool doesn't work, the fact that it exists at all means there's hope for you. And, it, and if you know a tool exists and you don't use it, you, how should we say this, euphemistically? So sh yeah, shame on you. Yeah, shame. that's a good one. Okay, shame on you. And it, it becomes a philosophy of life. It's like most of the big opportunities in life come after something bad happens. That's, that's just the way it works. And that, I, wow. That is great. That is great. Yeah. Because yeah, so. a lot of times people get fired, right? And then from getting fired, they actually find out what they want to do. Yeah. Sometimes your, your spouse will leave you and you're brokenhearted and you're devastated for a year, but you end up meeting someone yes. that you have a better relationship with. Yes. Uh, so nothing really good. I mean, <laughs> everything really good comes out of suffering and pain. Yeah, the way to look at it is suffering and pain are preludes to something good that's going to happen. But first you got to wor work your way through the something bad. But the, the total of something bad and then coming in, turning it into something good, that's called the turnaround. And um, I, I, I um, symbolize it by, a, by a, a, a you. So like up here, you're kind of like in God's mind, so to speak. And you feel great. It's like you almost feel like you're God. But then if you want to become an individual, you have to go down the, the you to the, to the bottom. That's a trough. And at that point, you feel like you're an individual, but you don't know shit, and you're completely helpless. Now, the idea of therapy is, is to come back up from that trough, if you know what I mean by trough, the low point. It's much more powerful to come back from a low point 
that it is to succeed where there has been no low point. The person who succeeded without a low point will eventually crack up and quit because he doesn't have the fiber. Anyway, if you so anyway, these um, turnarounds, they're just a little use. They're the only thing you can take with you into uncertainty, nothing else. It's like you go in naked. Are there any girls here? No. So it's, it's like you go in holding your dick, so to speak. <laughs> um, and then you, have, then you can't deal with the uncertainty. And when, when something happens that's unpredictable, uh, you tend to run and go home. Um, wow. Is that why Phil and I, I, I can't believe this, but every person I know who's ever came from, every child, who's ever came from a wealthy family who had a trust fund of a $500 million, a million dollars, they all end up bad. Yeah. And that's because they, they live life, they never went down the trough. They never went down. They never went down the trough. They were always on top and they're fragile and they're fragile. And then when real life comes along, because life is hard, life don't give a shit how famous you are, <laughs> how much money you got, how powerful you think you are, life will knock you on your ass. They can't handle it, and they go to drugs or self-medicate. Yeah, that's, that's correct. So, and it's such an important point. Parents today, not all of them, but a lot of them think their job is to protect their children from this pain or these demands. Or right. Or uncertainty. They think it's, the, you know, you get these helicopter parents. Right. They're fucking killing their children. They're killing them. Their soul, not, not I don't mean physically. And they don't even realize it. They, they feel they're doing everything for their kids. It's spread like a disease. And, and one of the things that it does, amongst other damaging things, is it creates this in-group. The guy wrote a book about this. It's, re it's a really good book. What he was saying is the uppies, or whatever you want to call them, they don't cheat and kill and lie. They just play by a game that they set the rules for. So therefore, because they set the rules, they're the ones who win. Everybody else loses. So the game is, it's, it's not like the people that are these bankers, or, it's not that they're bad people. They don't have an awareness, not all of them, but most of them, they don't have an awareness of the effects of their actions. So you get all these things going down um, almost outside of consciousness. And that's, um, Okay, so let me see if I can say this clearly. Because, Barry, we're starting this social uh, media thing. That yeah. Comes. So, and, and we're going to make it fairly cheap. Except there's some courses that will be more expensive. But mostly, it's I want it to be cheap. So somebody could pay $30, $40 and, and, you know, get what we're getting. And get what we're getting here. Right, right. Yeah. So, anyway, that's the idea. Um, because psychotherapy, is, in one way, has fucked things up. In one way, it's been great, but in another way, it's fucked things up because it's created two classes because the people with no money and no position, they, they don't get psychotherapy. Um, wow. But that's part of the purpose of what you're doing. And Right. That's why I do my podcast, to try to yeah. give all the stuff that you taught me to put it out there, you know? Yeah, and that's why so many people come to hear it or see it because, it, it, because it's, it's not the result of a... How would you say it? Like a contrived thing made up by a professor, right. professors or shrinks. It's not, it's not that. It, it comes right from the guts, like right from the heart. Right. And um, I always felt like this, even when I was young, like when I was 27, 28, but the, the psychiatrists wouldn't, they wouldn't accept it. One guy, one guy said, I was talk, talking to this guy about tools. I was developing a couple of rudimentary tools. Right. And the guy said, you can't do that. I said, what? It's still working. He said, he said, no, no, no. You're forbidden to ever teach anybody any, any kind of tools. We don't do that here. And, um, and the guy says, the guy says um, you have to be patient, he says. And I, said, I, will, I, was, I was a bad boy at that age. I said, oh, is that why they call them patients? Wow. <laughs> I didn't have a good relationship with him after that. But, but anyway. I, I felt compelled to move forward into this. Um, well, because a lot of doctors, they treat the problem, but they don't treat the cold. Right. You know what I'm saying? They, 
they they'll treat you and they'll and they make you okay. I understand this, I understand that, but they don't tell you how to fix the damn thing. Yeah. But what you did and what Barry did, you're telling people how to fix the problem. Yes. Here's a tool that you could fix the problem and how to do it. And that's why for me, for me, it was so helpful. And I think you're right. I think this this class, and we'll, we'll have you back on again when you talk about going online, where people can get this for $30, $40. Yeah. You know, because you're right. There are people in the inner cities and, and places like that. Who, they can't afford to go to a psychiatrist. No. And then if they do, they, they tend to get placed with people that are in a bureaucratic system so that they don't really... They need the people in the ghetto need information. That's the main thing. Wow. So you really feel and listen to this, parents. And this is coming from Dr. Phil Stutz. That the more you coddle your your child, you're actually hurting him. You're hurting him. I'm not saying you gotta like be tough love and throw him in the street. We're not saying that, right? Right? No, Phil? absolutely not. No, we're just saying that there are things they have to do on their own. Yes. And it's better that they fail sometimes and they learn. Because if you try to coddle them, when they fail on their own, when they're older, it's going to be very hard to take. Yeah, it's like a human life is a thing. It's one big fat opportunity. And if you're 90, you look back and you say, well, I blew that opportunity. I didn't do shit. You feel, it's, it's one of the worst feelings you could possibly have. What Barry puts in... Uh, if you know, you know his thing. He says if you, if you, everyone has a song to sing, and it's like I forget the wording of it. But the worst thing is to be old and know you didn't so, sit, you didn't sing your own song. You didn't sing your own song. You want the mediocrity and safety. And I say this with all due respect to people. You know, I'm not saying everybody can do this in one day, but it's a direction. If you can't do it, it's good to try to talk to your kid about it. Um, and it had because. Think about it like this. What's happening now, let's say in the last two years, we've been invaded, we're, we're at war. Um, it's just you can't see the other soldiers. They're like these tiny little things. We're at war with who, Phil? We're at war with Part X. We're at war with Part X. Yeah. Right. And that's why the world is so fucking crazy. Yeah. And that's why what I, what I say to you is, the, Part X is so strong, or if you want to use it as a, you can say, Part X is so loud Mm. It's it's like the loudest voice on the earth uh, in the negative way that we want to get the positive voice yes. just as loud. That's right, or and, louder. Or louder, mm -hmm. or louder. And that's why I do my podcast. That's why I talk about things. That's why I entertain, but I also try to teach. And and and, and, our, and my, my job is 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 to, to learn from you and to put it out there for people who... Uh, you know, who could better their life? Who really could better their life, I think. You know? Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And um, you, you, people who do that, like what you're doing, but there are other people who are doing it. Believe it or not, they become more creative as a result. They become more creative. Yeah, because, you see, the nature of the universe is it's flowing outwards. It's, it's almost like it's, fl it's, it's flying away from you. Right. And the only way you can keep up with it is by being coming like it. So at that point, that's called an outflow state. It's a giving state. And if you could get in the habit, of, but through giving and how you treat other people, you're, you're in this outflow state. It also brings other things with it that you wouldn't anticipate. Right. And, and we I just, we'll talk about that just a little more. And that is the flow. And I remember you teaching me the flow because I remember when I was writing and you said you got to write. Yeah, and I, I and I said, well, I wrote Brock's Tale, and and then I wrote this other thing right after that, and that got made, and that was a, a that was excellent. What was the name of that? Uh, Faithful. Yeah, I did that. Faithful. That was a hit show, and it was a hit movie. And then I started making money, and I started forgetting my writing, and I, as an actor, and you said, you know, Chaz, you got to get back to writing. Then I started writing a little more, and now I said, you know, I'm writing more now, but. And I said, well, sometimes I, I'm not inspired. I remember you said you you can't sit down and not be inspired all the time. You got you. Sometimes you won't be inspired a lot. And you said treated it like a lunch pail, like you're going to work. Get behind the thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of songwriters or or actors or, or actors or songwriters they go, well, I got to be inspired. No, no, you don't feel like doing it. Get behind the guitar. Get behind the computer, and do it because the flow will come and you will be inspired. 
Yeah, you know, there's a famous quote by Picasso. Picasso. Oh, you know this thing? No, I don't know, no. Um, he was, somebody was interviewing him, some journalist, and they, they asked him, is inspiration, is that a real thing? And he says, yeah, it is. But when God visits you, he better find you working. And that's <laughs> oh, he's going to be pissed off. When God visits you, he better find you working. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> whoa, whoa, that took me back a little bit. Yeah, that's a good one. No, that's a good one because... And Picasso was so uh, Picasso was so prolific. Yeah, I mean, he died when I think he was eighty nine or ninety. Yeah, he was. Still, he and was, he he painted to the last day of his life. This guy. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I, I think that's a great lesson for people that the flow. And it's like actors who say, you know, actors who never make it. I, what about these people that go, I never caught a break in my life. I never caught a break. I look at these people and I say, you never caught a break because you never recognize the break. Man. There were many breaks that you caught and they're so tight. They're like this. And when the flow of life hits them, it bounces off. Them. Yes. But when they're open, like the hand is open, the flow of life goes right through you. So I truly believe that the, the more you hit the dominoes in the right direction, the more the flow comes. Well, most of these people aren't from the Bronx. They may not know what dominoes are. Oh, dominoes, you're <laughs> right. Dominoes like a little thing that you hit, and they go boop, 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 boop. And they, they, yeah. But, but to put it another way is the, most you, the more good choices you make, the better your life will be. It's really that simple. Yeah, yeah. And this guy, a friend of mine, his name is Brian Johnson. He's he's starting this social media thing. It's huge. Brian Johnson. Yeah. Right. But his thing is, and this is so great. He he has these things, the eight virtues. I don't want to mess it up by saying it, but but it's it's what you'd expect. There's nothing unusual about the virtues. But what he says is, if you want to do something big, and you want to want to make a lot of money. You want to have an impact. All that is great, but he says if your foundation isn't based on these virtues, you'll never make it, especially now. And he wrote a book? Uh, no, he's got a he's got this huge thing on, on this. I don't know, social media thing. And what are the do you know what the virtues are? Um, I was no. just curious. No, okay. I can't remember. Right, but he said if you follow these virtues. He said, he said you have to follow them. You have to. If you if you don't follow them, God and quotes, whoever... whoever but, I mean, what we talk about is obviously some of the virtues. There has to be. Yeah, oh, yeah. There yeah. has to be a lot of them. Yeah, you know, because it's, it's like for a mass audience, so he has to pick out certain things and just bang people's head, bang people over the head with it. Right. Um, but, he, but he's in real contra contradistinction to a lot of other guys that are in that social media wow. world. Wow. Because they're, they're either directly or indirectly, directly they're offering you something that doesn't exist. Right. Is, you know, but I mean, and, and we're going to wrap it up soon right now, but Phil, these people on, on, on TikTok, or, and they got 80, billion, 80 million followers and these young kids are making all this money. I mean, I know what's, believe me, and people say, oh, you're jealous. No, I'm not. I'm not jealous because my career is good. But... I feel bad for them because how are they going to survive in the real world when they get older? God knows, man. I don't know. They have no bottom line. So the most important thing in a human being, especially when you teach your children, is to give them a foundation. Yes. Because without, I mean, God said that, a foundation with sand is, is, is doomed. But hey, you know what, Phil? I, I cannot thank you enough. I want to remind the audience that Dr. Phil Stutz and Barry Michaels, Dr. Barry Michaels, have these books, The Tools, also Coming Alive. All the stuff we talked about here, and we're going to have the doc, uh, Dr. Phil Stutz back on. Maybe we'll get Barry to come too. Yeah, he we'll, get both, we'll get both of you on. And uh, I, I just want to thank you so much. If you'd like to come and see my one-man show, the original one-man show that everybody always talks about, go on chazpalmentary.net. Dot net. My full uh, a tour is there starting in March for the United States. My whole tour of the United States starting in March. It'll be at a city near you. I want to thank you so much. Uh, don't forget to go to my store, my merchandise. God bless you all. And uh, I just want to say, Phil, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, anytime. We really. Do I do this every day. Every like, I know. I, I cannot believe it. After 30 years, <laughs> I finally got Dr. Phil Stutz. <laughs> to sit down and talk. God bless you all. Good night.